Hi butterflies, welcome to my garden. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And now let's get into the video. And I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. Hi everybody, it's your girl Calypso and I am back again. I'm back, I'm back. I'm back again, I'm back again, I'm back, back, back again. <laughs> get over it, I would never get tired of that, okay? Mm. So today I'm going to be discussing trans pioneers in true history. Just trans men and women, mostly women that I've come across so far. But this trans pioneers through history because I saw something a while ago where there was a comment somewhere on one of the social media platforms i should have taken a screenshot of it damn anyway so this comment was like oh this whole trans thing seems like a trend you know people are just jumping on the trans bandwagon or something and um it was a man who wrote it that's why i'm doing the voice um so he got me thinking like look this is just ignorance that that statement was pretty ignorant but it inspired me to start up this whole series that i'm gonna do as well and it's about history just to show people that we've been here we've been around we've existed and you just didn't know how to look you just didn't know where to find us oh we were just on the ground and we're just starting to get momentum and now you're being so bothered so we've existed we've been here we have lived okay cast that word around now my first person that I'm going to do a little breakdown on is Miss Christine Jorgensen. Yes, that that Christine. Oh my god, she is so fascinating. I find her very fascinating because can you imagine what it must have been like for her in that era? Oh my god. Like mad respect to her. I am giving her her flowers today. So let's get let's just get into it. Um, she was born on the 30th of May in 1926 in the Bronx, New York City. Shout out to the Bronx. <laughs> and I will not be naming her previous name because I don't really believe in dead naming people. But yeah, she was born in the Bronx. And, um, you know, growing up, she always felt that she was different from the other boys. And I think they also noticed it too and they picked up on it because she was the re recipient of relentless bullying, you know, and even her own sister chimed in on it as well. She chimed in now and then because um, Christine was the youngest child of two in a, in a family, they, she was the youngest of two. And her, her older sister chimed in now and then. So, you know, they picked on her feminine attributes, her tendencies, and her mannerisms. Oh, I can relate to that. Because <laughs> growing up in Nigeria, yeah. Let's just say it wasn't... Uh, my childhood wasn't terrible, but it wasn't the best either. Because kids, they can be, they can be horrible, man. And... I know I got it I got it bad from a lot of the kids in the neighborhood school and so I can relate. So she seemed to gravitate towards dolls and dainty things. She always dreamed of having that elegant feminine qualities, you know, the things that she grew up seeing because in the 1920s in 1920s she was born told in the 1920s so i'm gonna say in the 1930s when she started coming of age as a little kid you know she probably saw you know those golden hollywood era movies you know the harlow jean and ginger rogers and those eloquent those elegant um elegant movie stars of the time and so she was that was like the standard of beauty and so for a little white kid you know it would be easier for her to for her to want to aspire to that you know so i can imagine just sidebar anyway so but one of the things that i admire about her story is that she was she was lucky that she came from a very close-knit family and you know despite her messy 
older sibling who was chiming in to the bullying but her family was pretty close-knit and her grandmother was her was a champion and she was her biggest cheerleader because she encouraged her to express herself and to you know be authentic and that's and that's admirable because I feel like every child who's different needs that support system especially if it's a child who's who falls under the LGBT IQA you know LGBT plus let's just put it that way especially when it's a child of the rainbow it helps to have a supportive environment as well so kudos to her grandmother shout out to her grandmother may she rest in peace and um, in high school she realized her attraction to men or boys whatever this was in high school however she never really felt that she was gay she knew she liked boys but even though she was born male she didn't feel like she was gay okay and um, she just realized that she was like a little girl trapped in a boy's body huh sounds familiar <laughs> And after graduating high school, this was during the World War II, by the way. So um, she tried to enlist in the army, but she was denied because of her she, her first initial trial. She was denied entry into the army because of her dainty weight and her size. She was she was a petite per she was a pe petite little thing. She was just tiny petite. So she wasn't. Um, allowed entry into the army based off of that but however she was accepted a second time you know a couple of months later and then she was drafted and stationed at Fort Dix New Jersey and during um, this time of her service god my throat's so dry during the time of her service she kept mostly to herself understandably and she concealed her attraction to men, understandably, because keep in mind that during World War II, which was between, which was from the 1st of September, 1939 to the 2nd of September, 1945, six years later, just keep in mind that during this era, you know, LGBT was not allowed to exist. You know, so you can imagine that the army or the navy, anything military at that time, they had a zero tolerance for anything that was LGBT. So you can get thrown in jail, you can be court martialed, and you can be dishonorably you can be dishonorably discharged from the military, and that could forever taint your reputation and it could taint your legacy. Your if you come from a legacy of men and family members who had served in the military just that fact that you are dishonorably discharged or caught martialed or thrown in jail for being gay that could taint your entire family's reputation and it could taint your family's legacy so join, keep in mind that this was just putting it in context of why she concealed all of that during this period okay so and she also said later on that she enlisted for two reasons because she enjoyed the feeling of being needed and that the feeling of being needed and wanting to belong you know she was always the outsider so she always felt the need to belong and she, the second reason was because she wanted to make her family proud oh ah, i'm very fascinated by her like she was excuse me she was a bad bitch okay <laughs> anyway so she was this she was honorably not dishonorably she was honorably discharged from the military in 1946 she, yeah and that was when when did she join so I, it, it's unclear when she actually got drafted but she um oh no i believe she okay she joined the war was over in 1945, but she got the, on this. She got honorably discharged in 1946. God, I am just get it together, girl. Get it together. Mm. Anyway, so after her military service, I think she went. Then she went back to school. She studied photography, 
and then she also went to a dental assistant school as well where she started becoming a dental assistant and um, I think she also worked as a dental assistant as well as well as a photographer and she was deeply unhappy with her life there was a sense of um, discontentment I guess or uncontentment is that how you say it so there was a sense of unhappiness with her life you know and then she started doing a lot of research about gender identity and um, gender reassignment hormone therapy and that was when she discovered and consulted with several doctors who were in Europe about who had already performed gender reassignment surgeries and um, she was determined to start transitioning because you know when you come across something like that a lot of things start to make sense about why she had been feeling so different to the other kids to the other little, little boys because she never really felt like she was one of them remember i said she was attracted to men but she never knew but she knew that she wasn't gay because she never felt like a man which is something that i personally can relate to as well so you know in discovering all of that she was determined to hold um you know she had found she felt like she had found answers when she discovered you know the whole gender reassignment surgery and hormone therapy it made sense and she felt like she would benefit from something like that so she started to do her consultation you know she did her consultations and she started asking questions it's important girls and men trans men trans women it's important to ask questions do your research you know ask as many questions as you can consult as many different people get a second opinion a third if you can you know because if you're gonna do this you're gonna you want to have to you want to do it properly you want to make sure that you're in good hands and with somebody who has your best interest I can't stress that enough anyway so in 1950 she traveled to Denmark initially she wanted to go to Sweden but she made a stop in Denmark in 1950 to visit relatives and then that was when she came across a doctor um, a doctor endocrinologist who by the name Dr. Christian Hamburger so he agreed to do the experimental procedure for free because keep in mind again always remember this was the 1950s you know Hormone therapy, it's something that wasn't perfected yet. It was still a new um, procedure in terms of medical science. Although we've existed, but they didn't always have the right technology or the right medical science to back us up. Then, hell, this, there's still some questionable medical practices that is happening today, but that's another story, that's another video. Anyway, so this doctor decided to do this experimental procedure for free because she was i guess she was a lab rat or a test dummy i don't know she was a you know experimental hamster in this case so he decided to do the work for free and i guess she was okay with it because she went on with it so um he believed in her identity and um he believed that she wasn't homosexual that she indeed was a transsexual so he believed in her identity she, so for the next couple of years that she stayed over in denmark she underwent hormone therapy she went on the word psychiatric psychiatric analysis as part of her transition you know psychiatry is important therapy is important like going to a therapist and while you're undergoing your hormone treatment it's important because you're going through so much changes like emotional changes physical changes mental changes that it helps to have that support system or to help have that um, support you know the therapeutic support to help you along the way because trust me it is not easy you know it is not easy but I think it's worth it because you most some of us grow up dreaming of you know some people grow up dreaming like oh when I grow up I'm gonna be a doctor or I'm gonna be an engineer or I'm gonna be a lawyer some of us just grow up and wanting to be happy wanting to be a woman and an elegant woman so I think she was one of those so she was yeah I'm very fascinated by her I think she was a 
Wow. Anyway, um, she did change her name to Christine in honor of the doctor who believed in her, Christian Hamburger. Isn't that sweet? So I think they probably had developed a friendship of some sort because, yeah, she took she took on the Christine to honor him, and yeah, that was just a that was really sweet and touching to read. Um, and then upon her arrival back in America, her story captivated the press. It made headlines. She became like an overnight sensation, and from somebody who was practically a nobody to being on the cover of the newspapers and be a topic of relentless gossip and fascination, she was overwhelmed. And I thank you all for coming, but I think it's too much. It must have been overwhelming, I don't blame her, and I'm sure she was overwhelmed too. But she handled it with such class, with poise and dignity and elegance and just even the way her mannerisms and the way she answered questions and just the way she carried herself and She was, you can tell that she had studied this. Like this is something that she had paid attention to. You know, from the way she moved her hands and the way she carried herself, the way she wore her hair, her outfit, everything. There was just this effortless elegance. that takes a lot of effort, that takes a lot of, you know, patience. And yeah, I, I you just, you just, you can't help but admire that, especially in that era, okay? In that era. So the media, the media noticed it and she was praised for her beauty. Don't get me wrong. She was praised for her beauty. And this was uh, remarkable in a time where um, <coughs> A lot of things that were LGBT were still kind of on the ground, but she was right there at the forefront. So before there was a Caitlyn Jenner, there definitely was a Christine Jorgensen. Okay. And the media praised her beauty, they praised her fashion sense, and they praised her service to the country, given that she had a military background. And she was kind of seen as the evidence of the advancement of technology and medical science. Here, the Scandinavian societies of Greater New York paid her a singular honor. It's my great pleasure to personally present to you with this citation here as the Woman of the Year for your contribution to the advancement of medical science. Thank you very much, Dr. Berlin. I want to say how deeply I am touched by this honor that has given, been given to me tonight, but I feel that those who should have been with us and were unable to be here are the ones that are really responsible for my success. And those are my friends in Denmark, my doctors and my friends. So she was a walking experiment. <laughs> she was like an experiment on legs, the, the evidence of the advancement of technology and medical science. <laughs> okay, get it together, girl, get it together. Anyway. Along with the positive coverage, though, came with the negative, as, is, as it is in most cases. And um, some of the media, they were quite invasive, though. <coughs> you know, you can imagine, during that era, this is before Me Too, this is before, before Time's Up and all of that. So, misogyny 
was very real. Transphobia was definitely real. Trans misogyny was definitely real. Okay, it must have been oof, twice as worse than it is today. Some of the media, they were quite invasive and they were quite disrespectful because they went as far as researching her doctors and reaching out to her European doctors, you know, to investigate all the steps that were involved in her transition. Why? Mind your business. Why? Like, I don't understand why she was treated that way. But then again, I wasn't born in that era. I wasn't there. I don't know. But they were so disrespectful to this girl. They did her, they did her wrong. <laughs> they did her wrong. You know, because all she wanted at that point, she, she really, she did say, she did say that she longed to have a quiet life, but it was almost next to impossible to have a quiet life because the media was so invasive and they were so pervasive too towards her so you know again hats off to her hats off to her wow anyway she always because and when they were doing this investigation and invasiveness invasion of her privacy that was when they discovered that um that she didn't have the full female part yeah let your imagination run wild with that one so because prior to this, she always shied away and always avoided questions about her full anatomy. But she was only, but she was interested in talking about her experiences and her fashion and her journey. But she had always shied away from, you know, talking about um, her body part and her anatomy. Understandably so, because honestly, to everybody who is fascinated by a trans person's body, this is a PSA. It is none of your business. Stay out of our panties. What we have in between our legs, what we have underneath our clothes, what we have behind the bra, it's none of your business. Stay out of our stay out of our bodies. Unless we're inviting you to. I just stay out of it. If you're not sleeping with me, if you if, if we're not dating and I'm not and I don't intend to sleep with you, it's none of your business. It's none of your business. I understand human curiosity, but it's none of your business. That's like me walking up to a random stranger and be like, hey, what's your bank account details? Rude. Anyway, so as a result of this discovery, um, because they always assume, they always assume like, okay, she transformed from a G.I. Joe to a blonde beauty. That's what the headline said. I wasn't there. I didn't write it. They did. So, um, because of all of those headlines that she was making, they all assumed that she had the full functioning female organ. So when, um, as a result of that discovery that she didn't have the full female part, she was basically shunned by the media and they kind of dubbed her as an altered male and a morbid transvestite. Oof, that makes me, reading that part made me so upset. You know, she was seen as nothing more, and according to her autobiography, she was seen as nothing more than a limp wrist, than a limp wristed queer who indulged in culturally female activities. She got a lot of heat and unfavorable backlash, even from LGBT, members of the LGBT, because she did say in her auto, and also it was, she said in her autobiography as well, um, I didn't get, I, I wasn't able to get full access to the whole thing because it's so hard to get a copy of her autobiography, although I would love to get it, but I couldn't get a hold of it. But I read a few excerpts in it. And also, there's a, there's a documentary on Netflix. It's called Disclosure. So there's a small segment in that documentary where she was briefly discussed. And it said that some of the fan mail, one of the hate mail that she got, because this was pre-internet, you guys. So she was actually getting mail, like letters, you know. In one of the mails, a gay man sent her a razor. A gay man sent her a razor. And in that razor, the razor came with a note that says, now you can finish what the doctor started. What the doctors couldn't finish or something. He gave her a razor in the mail. Let that sink in. That's what they did to this woman. Like, I... <sighs> Some people are not gonna like what I'm about to say, but some of you gay men, some of y'all can be quite transphobic. Some of you get a trap. 
are, some of you are very transphobic. And that's the truth. Well, I'll give you one example and I'm not even going to go into full specifics. I'll just give you one example and then we'll move on. There's this show called Chasing LA. Watch that show and see what I'm talking about. Disgusting. This, the transphobia from some of the men on that show towards this woman, Alicia. Disgusting. Sick. Moving on. Um, now, she wanted, she always had dreams of being this Hollywood star, but she never really made it quite big. She never really made it big, to be honest. But she did have a successful run performing in nightclubs and lounges, and um, she had a successful nightclub act. And she did, you know, a few, a, a bit of stints on TV, radio, and on theater. And she, 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 like I said before, she wanted a quiet life, but she could never really make a living. She, she, the only way she could make a living was by making public appearances, you know. So she toured. She spent most of her life like touring campuses and other venues, university campuses, by the way, and other venues, you know, discussing her experiences. She was known for her polished wit. She was known for her directness. She was known for her elegance, her poise, her... She was known for all of those things that I mentioned before because she was a refined, elegant woman, you know? Ladies, take notes, okay? Take notes. Hell, even I'm still polishing myself, okay? <laughs> Um, she had several romantic relationships and, but however, the two that really stuck out are her two engagements. Like, she was engaged to, uh, labor, um, oh god, I, I have some of the names written down, but I feel like I'm gonna butcher it. So if I mention something wrong, please don't, um, please don't get mad, okay. So she was, she was in, she planned to marry a labor, a labor union statistician called John Traub or Traub, I don't know. However, the engagement got, it was called off. And in 1959, she was also engaged to a typist called Howard J. Knox. However, um, they couldn't secure a driver, they couldn't, <laughs> not driving license, they couldn't get a proper the application to get a marriage license was denied because her birth certificate still um, still classified her as male. And back in the day, you know, gay marriage was illegal. You know, same-sex marriage was illegal, period. And so the application to get a marriage license was denied because her birth certificate still reflected her gender as, still listed her gender as male. Uh, even to this very day, the whole birth certificate thing is such a nightmare. It's such a real thing for the trans community. A lot of us are still struggling to change our birth certificate, especially after we've transitioned, after we've, we've begun the process of transitioning. You know, it's still a struggle. It's still a whole protocol to change your birth certificate. I don't even know if, I don't even know if you fully can in most parts of the world, but in Australia, it's still a struggle, it's still a challenge. So I sympathize and I empathize with what she must have experienced, especially, you know, you meet somebody and you're crazy in love with them or all you just want to do is marry them and you can't. Even for the LGBT couples, the same sex couples who were just pining for the days, for the day to come when their love would be legal, you know? Anyway, so they were denied the marriage license and then um the engagement was called off too and shortly after the engagement was announced howard the fiance he lost his job so the discrimination was real the transphobia was real was definitely real and um yeah so she safe to say that she never really had a successful she never had much luck with men which is sad. It's really sad. I don't know about her later life though, because um, not much was known about her love life after that. I, maybe she kept everything on the wraps. Who knows? She might have, you know, had somebody in her last days. But yeah, it just from the outside looking in and from doing my research and reading as much as I could about her, it didn't seem like she had much luck with men. And that's sad. Like everybody needs love. I mean, I'm glad that at least she got to experience it. And she got to at least be engaged, 
meet somebody who was openly willing to claim her, even though it cost him his career. But, you know, I'm looking on the bright side. At least she had that. At least she experienced love in her life. So that's just one way of looking at it. And um, yeah, she published her autobiography in 1967 because, and that was the year that her parents died and she moved to New York. She moved to, no, not New York. She moved to California in 1967. And that same year she published her autobiography and it was a bestseller. Obviously, people were still fascinated by her despite all the negative media that she got. You know, the media did her dirty. They did her wrong. But despite that, she always... Re what I admired about her is like, despite all the obstacles and all the roadblocks that she experienced, she still had such a positive outlook on life. And you can't help but admire that. You can't help but, you know, th that was admirable. That was really something to be... You gotta commend her for that. That was that was amazing. You know, she was always optimistic, and you can see from her interviews. You live in Laguna Beach, that many of your friends were of the gay or homosexual persuasion. Oh yes, of course they are. Why? I live in an so. art colony. Heavens, I've got friends in every direction. Uh, I find, uh, and let's face it, if I'm going to a premiere, I'd rather go with a gay man than an average man. He knows how to do it. I mean, we get out of the car and the limousine, he looks great and the whole thing. Oh, I thought you meant something else. Huh? Oh, well, he might know how to do that, yeah. but not with me. <laughs> yeah, seeing that, you can see, you, you can see that she still had a sense of humor. She still had a glow about life, you know, and she still maintained her poise and dignity and her elegance, even to her final days. And, um, yeah, she sold up, you know, her father built her a house in New York and but she left the house after her parents died obviously it was too painful for her and she decided to move to sunny California and publish her autobiography and move on with her life and um, later on she um, she did die she died in <sighs> she died in 1989 of bladder and lung cancer and she died four weeks before her 63rd birthday. So her birthday was on March 30th. So she probably died either at the end of April, most likely at the end of April, before her 63rd birthday. But the thing is, um, her legacy lives on. Like, you know, her legacy lives on and she would, yeah, she was a trailblazer. She was a hero. She was, uh, she broke the glass ceilings for girls like me. You know, she crawled so that I can walk. She crawled so that Caitlyn Jenner can walk and Laverne and Janet's and, you know, the it girls in the trans community. Before all of those girls, there was Christine. And she was, yeah, she was one of those trailblazers, one of those iconic trans women who, you know, made it happen for herself. And that's to be applauded, you know, that is to be admired and respected. So yeah, her legacy lives on. And um, in June, 2019, she was one of the inaugural um, 50 American pioneers, trailblazers and heroes who was included in the national LGBTQ wall of honor within the Stonewall National Monument in New York City's Stonewall Inn. So yes, yes, the girl is cemented, honey, in this iconic Stonewall Hotel. So yeah, um, look. <sighs> Christine, Christine. You do, I just imagine, I can't help but imagine what it must have been like. Like, it must have been hard. It must have been, like, I even, I, I get emotional just imagining what she, this woman went through. Like, oh my God, wow. Hats off to you, lady, rest in peace. So, yeah, that's one of the many iconic women who have existed. And um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do some more research and bring some more. But for now, I'm starting off with the iconic Christine Jorgensen and I hope you're able to learn something from this video and yeah, so keep the peace, spread love, take care of each other, protect your energy and be kind. So 
Bye everyone.